My name is Vince Vilak. I'm a professor of multimedia journalism in the Department of Advertising, Multimedia, and Public Relations at the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh. I've published a number of textbooks with SAGE, and I've spent a lot of time in the past few months learning a lot about AI because it's something that is the, you know, the overwhelming force that we're all going to have to try to understand. And I think it's something that we need to talk about in more concrete terms than we've been talking about it lately. So I'm hoping this will be informative and helpful. Well, I, I think the most important thing to understand right away is the basic concept of what we're talking about in terms of AI. The underlying premise has been around for decades. And it all it really is is simply about trying to get machines to do the cognitive work that only people used to be able to do. So you probably used a lot of artificial intelligence already without giving it much of a thought. So when you have a spell checker that gives your article kind of a look-see and make sure that you're not making any mistakes, you know, you're using AI. Uh, when you ask Siri to translate a voice message into a text to send to your friend, you're using AI. And, you know, if you're playing a game online and you're playing chess or checkers or whatever, you know, the strategy there is all basically AI. But what we're seeing now and what we're talking about in terms of, you know, the usage in newsrooms and advertising and PR um, is what's called generative AI. And it's a form of technology that can produce content such as essays, images, videos, and so forth, pretty much prompted on its own. So this kind of AI can be extremely helpful as kind of a helper instead of a doer. So if you think about it, for example, in a newsroom, we have transcription services like Otter AI uh, that can take algorithms and decipher speech patterns and be able to take that whole interview that you did over the past hour off of a sound file and dump it into a text-based format. And that way you can go through and kind of pick out the quotes. Uh, you can use a tool like pinpoint or artifact to research topics for you uh, in case you need to summarize something for an ad client or to summarize a, a project in public relations um, or even in news for that matter or even in say something like sports so let's say that you wanted to understand um, you had to talk about the game cricket and you wanted to understand how the rules of cricket are different and yet similar to the game of baseball you could have AI go through and do a comparative analysis where it compares and contrasts these things and then develop a very short explanation for you. So if you're a sports reporter who was trying to cover a cricket match for the first time, that could be really helpful. Or if you had to explain to somebody who is a cricket fan who's never seen a baseball game what things are similar and what things are different. You know, even programs like Chatbot or Bright Sonic or TextBlaze that write content to you can be helpful. So if you have a difficult time trying to restate something uh, that someone told you, you can use one of these programs to kind of help you out. Same thing is true when you're looking for a new approach to an old idea. Uh, these tools can suggest various angles and ideas. And really, at the end, I mean, AI has a lot to like in it for writers, for journalists, for public relations practitioners, for advertisers, because they can really make life better for us. <laughs> yeah, this is really where the rubber hits the road for this kind of a discussion. The important thing to understand about AI is that it's a tool. And just like any tool you have, the goodness or the badness of that tool is really only directly attached to the person using it. So for example, think about a hammer. Uh, you can, I could use a hammer to make help make a dog house for the new family pet. And you know that's a really sweet and decent thing to do with a hammer. Uh, I could also use a hammer to kill somebody, which is a felony in most places. Uh, the point is you really can't blame the tool for what happens if a person misuses it. And you really can't also blame or assume that the tool will do everything for you perfectly on its own. That's one of the big drawbacks of AI is people just kind of let AI run and figure something will happen with it. You know, if I want to cut wood to make that doghouse, I can't just start up my circular saw and throw it in the middle of my workshop and figure it's going to go run around and do what it needs to do. I have to have it in my hands. I have to guide it appropriately. So in short, the true skill is in the user, not necessarily the tool. 
Now, we've already had instances where media practitioners have relied on AI to write stories for them, create quotes that were fake for them, uh, build fake images for them, and other things. Uh, we've had people publish AI content uh, that was created without fact-checking at first, which led to all sorts of problems. What everyone is really grappling with right now in today's environment is how to deal with AI appropriately now that the you know the ketchup's out of the bottle, so to speak. So places that have really harsh restrictions on AI might be really limiting a number of effective and legitimate tools that their uh, their people can use. Um, and that makes it really difficult for them as craftspeople. Places that don't pay enough attention to this and kind of have a laissez-faire attitude about it can really see a ton of abuse. So regardless of what any one place decides to do, a, the crucial element always comes down to the ethical and professional standards of the people involved. The biggest professional and ethical failures that I have seen always happen when people try to cut the corner and they do it because they're lazy or they're disinterested and they they kind of make those uh, those ethical lapses, let's call them. And AI is no different. It's just new in that regard. So I think that's something that we really need to think hard, long and hard about when it comes to AI is what kind of people are using it and then what are some of the standards we need to set forth for them. Wow, uh, that's kind of tricky because I don't think we've even seen an inkling of the capabilities of this technology yet. Uh, it would be kind of like asking Edison, you know, what the future of electricity was after he got done, you know, turning on the electric light for the first time. No matter how good we are at guessing about this stuff, it isn't going to be easy and we're going to be wrong more than we're going to be right. Now, what I can say is that just like most cases in life, I feel we learn more from when we fail than when we succeed. Now, I can I can personally attest to that. I know that, you know, every story I tell my students basically about how to report or write or do anything comes from something stupid that I did and then immediately decided I never wanted to have that stupid thing happen again. So to that end, I think we've started to see this already when it comes to AI. Sports Illustrated, for example, tried to create not just AI content, but they tried to create complete AI staff members to augment their staff. And people figured that out and they really rightly complained about it. And AI, you know, kind of got a bad rap on, on Sports Illustrated. And SI took it apart and decided we're not, we're not going to do that again. So that that at least hopefully keeps them from uh, taking another shot at that. So as we continue to find things that AI can do, we're going to figure out a lot of the things that we don't want it to do because we're going to bump into things. We're going to crash into walls. We're going to make mistakes. And that will help us decide exactly how far we really want AI to go as far as being a tool for us to be effective in, in our newsrooms and in pretty much anything else having to do with media.